Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jeremy Gilarno. I'm one of the maintainers of the uh, LTTNG project, along with uh, Mathieu Desnoyers. We're both at uh, Efficios. I'll start with a quick word about Efficios. If you don't know the company, uh, we help customers build development, monitoring, and debugging tools. Everything we do is open source. Uh, we are behind the LTTNG project, uh, Babel Trace, Bear CTF, uh, and we contribute uh, regularly to uh, GDB and the Linux kernel. Uh, a large part uh, of what we do at FCS is bring ideas that originate in the kernel uh, down to user space, and LTTNG uh, is one of those things. Uh, we bring uh, tracing, as it is uh, imagined in the kernel, down to user space. And we're also behind the MemBarrier syscall and the restartable sequence uh, infrastructure that allows you to do proper um, per CPU data structure in uh, user space. So this talk is about new features in LTTNG uh, and how we're starting to move beyond uh, ring buffer tracing. I'm gonna start with uh, a brief introduction of uh, LTTNG, the, the project itself. Then I'll talk about the ring buffer tracing and its limitations. And then I'll go into new features in the, the last release and the following, uh, the, the, the next release, which are triggers and aggregation maps. And then I'll touch on some future work and I'll take your questions. So what is LTTNG? Well, first things first, um, I think it's good to talk about loggers when we talk uh, about tracers. Loggers, I assume you know what they are. Uh, you basically, the idea is that you basically add instrumentation point to your code and um, you take the opportunity to extract some uh, information about the state of your application or of the kernel uh, in the case of a tracer. Uh, with uh, tracing, the goal is the same, is to understand the state of your program at a given point in time. Um, in both cases, users have the same trade-offs uh, that they have to, to uh, take in mind. Uh, trade-off between verbosity and performance. Uh, performance both at runtime and at the analysis time. Um, I'd say the real difference is uh, the nature of the, the events that we target. Uh, when you talk about loggers, you're really gonna target high level events. Um, and the, the low frequency of those events is gonna make it possible to, to uh, log to text. When we're looking at tracers, we're more looking at very low level events, things like syscalls, things like RQ. Um, and in user space, it's gonna be very low level application events like memory allocations, job dispatch, and those kind of things. So things that can happen thousands or millions of times per second. So there isn't really a clear cut line between the two, but I would say that tracers, by the nature of what they try to record, have to go to a binary format and have to make certain trade-offs in terms of usability. Um, so I think it's a useful distinction to have. Uh, there are a ton of kernel tracers out there. Uh, Perf, Ftrace, the talk just before this one, uh, eBPF, starting to be active uh, in that front. Uh, for LTTNG, the goal uh, is to understand the interaction between components on the whole system. We're, we're not just focusing on the kernel itself. We want to understand the uh, interaction between applications, uh, between applications and the kernel, and between containers. So that's a bit different. A, a bit different. Um, to do that, having a kernel tracer is certainly useful, and that's why we have LTTNG modules. Uh, we use, we reuse the upstream kernel's uh, facilities, so things like trace points, uh, the hooks to perform uh, syscall tracing. We can extract their arguments. Uh, we reuse uh, U probes and K probes to uh, instrument dynamically existing code. Uh, but we have our own modules, basically to have our own uh, ring buffer implementation, our own filtering facilities, and um, to produce traces in the common trace format rather than having a bespoke uh, format uh, for every tracer. I'd say the big difference with other, um, other projects is that we have a user space tracer. Uh, that's really the big difference. Um, it allows you to instrument C, C++, Java, Python applications. And uh, you can certainly use it as a very efficient logger, but um, it has a number of advantages beyond that. Uh, first, it's very fast. It's basically the same code as the kernel tracer, uh, but it's also uh, type safe. So we don't cook strings. We keep the type information all the way down to the analysis, so that makes that a lot uh, simpler. 
uh, and more compact, and, then, and therefore more efficient. Uh, in LTTNG tools, it's really the uh, control plane uh, of the tracer. It's the control of the sessions and, and all that stuff. So a key uh, point of the uh, LTTNG design is that basically everything is influenced by uh, the, the nature and frequency of the information that we want to save. Um, users mostly want to, uh, are, well, they're mostly system developers, I would say. Uh, so if they are interested in events, it's going to be very high frequency, as I mentioned. For applications, it's going to be memory allocation and stuff like that. For kernel events, again, very high frequency events, as uh, Stephen showed uh, in the, the previous talk. Um, so it's not, even though it's a user space tracer, um, it's not really targeting tracing as uh, things like Jaeger or open tracing based tracers would define them. Uh, with Jaeger, for instance, you would uh, be interested in tracing requests that are going to be in the order of milliseconds. Um, for LTTNG, it's more events that are at the uh, microsecond or nanosecond uh, granularity that we are, we are interested in. So the focus is uh, on low intrusiveness. As you can imagine, tracing that many events, we have to be quite efficient. Uh, and for that, the ring buffer is the cornerstone, really, of uh, LTTNG. It's critical to the performance. Uh, and there, uh, as I may have mentioned, both the user and kernel space tracers share this, basically the same ring buffer code. Uh, so they are uh, lockless ring buffers that are allocated per CPU. They are um, lockless because we don't want to push back on the uh, applications, for instance. Uh, if you are producing more events than we can consume, we're just going to drop events or overwrite the older ones. Uh, you can choose both policies. And those buffers are endlessly tunable. Uh, you can choose a memory footprint. You can choose the access permissions per UID per process. Uh, and we have a number of settings to accommodate the real-time constraints. So ring buffer tracing is um, typically what people think about when they talk about tracing is really uh, saving to a ring buffer, um, really taking an event, so saying that, okay, this event occurred at that precise time on this CPU. You want to collect some context associated with that, so things like the UID or um, uh, the user space call stack at that moment, things like that. You write that to the ring buffer, and then either you trace to memory, you're not expecting to collect that, you just want to maintain it in the memory, and when something interesting happens, you capture a snapshot of that, uh, like a flight recorder, or uh, you can stream to the disk or through the network. So we support all of those uh, use cases. So that difference where you can lose event, it's really a key difference between tracers and loggers, again. Uh, all of this means that tracing is super cheap. Um, the instrumentation in the code, I won't say it's free, but it's almost free when it's not in use. Uh, when it's not in use, it's basically going to amount to a load in a correctly predicted branch. So not free, but very cheap. Um, but uh, when it is enabled, I did some tests on a fairly old Xeon, but just to give you a, a rough idea, uh, if you want to trace the time, the ID of the event um, in a, uh, a, an integer payload, it's going to take roughly 150 nanoseconds. It's the same ballpark figure for both the uh, user space tracer and the kernel space tracer, and I have more benchmark uh, later in the slides, but just to, something to have uh, in mind. So that's good that it's efficient. It means you can add a lot of instrumentation points in your code. You don't have to think so hard about that. Uh, but the, the, the bad side of that is that it's very easy to enable too many events, end up with a lot of noise. And uh, I'd say most of the features that we integrate in LTTNG are there to mitigate that, uh, to make it easier to filter on your events. So we provide a number of uh, facilities to mitigate that, the first one being uh, the event rule system, where basically we want to cut at the source. The event rule system is basically uh, an event rule that you can define, and you, for, you can define a, a pattern that the event name has to match. 
uh, you can add filter expressions. So uh, that would allow you to filter on the CPU ID, filter on things like uh, the payload of the events, uh, whether they are strings or, or integers or whatnot. Uh, you can add exclusions, have log level filtering as you would find in most loggers uh, and more. Uh, filter expressions, I'm gonna come back to that later because it's important, but uh, they are converted to a custom bytecode that is executed at runtime against the events when they happen. Um, so it's a very flexible uh, uh, filtering mechanism. Uh, and one thing uh, that separates it from most loggers, I would say it's uh, that all of this is entirely dynamic. So you never have to restart applications or restart the kernel or whatnot. Um, you can basically define new event rules, disable them, add them. Uh, you don't have to restart your applications or, or whatever. So from that point, it's very interesting. Now, just to show you what a, an event rule uh, actually looks like in the wild, uh, the first one that you have here, enable event, will allow you to trace to a ring buffer all of the sync file range syscalls that have a number of bytes that is larger than a page. So that's one use of the filtering facilities. And if you have instrumented your own applications, you can use basically the same event rules with the user space tracer, but you target the user space domain. And then you can add exclusions. So here you have a pattern that's gonna match all of the uh, my app worker underscore events. But maybe you have one spammy event that would introduce a lot of free noise. You can exclude it uh, from the get-go. And then you can add a filter. So if your events have a job name field, uh, you can filter on that. And uh, you would only get those that start with OSS submit. Uh, and you can have a log level associated with that. Uh, maybe to introduce the features, I want to talk about how people use tracing in the wild, or at least people that we interact with at uh, Efficios. I'd say there are two camps. There's the debugging side and there's monitoring. Uh, when you're debugging, it's pretty simple. Basically, you can reproduce your problem. Hopefully, it will. <laughs> um, but you can typically uh, afford to have storage on the target. You can afford to degrade performance a bit for that single machine if you're on a, in the cloud. Um, so that's fairly simple, and that's something that's out there for all tracers. You're gonna select events, trace to files, and as, a, as Stephen mentioned in the previous talk, use things like trace command and look at the, uh, the, the raw events themselves. But that's not something that's gonna be uh, very useful if you want to monitor, unfortunately. Uh, the users that we have that, that use LTTNG in production all the time, uh, they will basically uh, carefully choose events and event rules that they care about and trace to, uh, to in-memory ring buffers, not really writing to disk. Um, and if they do write to disk, it's gonna be very, very uh, high-level events, so basically something that you would find in a log. Um, so you would get some context if a problem occurs, and you would uh, capture a snapshot. So that would give you maybe weeks of trace data at a very high level, and then the last four or five seconds at a very detailed uh, uh, level of uh, information. So that's easy to deploy because basically a snapshot is not harder to, uh, to collect than how you would collect core dumps, for instance, in production. So you can have you know, a job that runs every once in a while that does that. And uh, what we're seeing more and more is people that mix and match. Um, so they will, uh, like I mentioned, they would keep a high level of trace over a long period, uh, take the snapshot, but also some more uh, involved uh, cases, I would say. People are gonna use uh, trace rotation, which is, which is like a log rotation, and uh, ship those trace archives offsite uh, for analysis or uh, process them on the target, depending on their use case. And another thing that we've seen is uh, uh, snapshot-based profiling, where basically people take periodical snapshots, like just the in-memory ring buffers, they analyze that, but over thousands of machines, that gives you a very good idea of what's going on everywhere, and you can, sort, uh, you can start to extract patterns from that. So you can imagine that the, one of the key limitations that setup is complex when you start to log around huge trace files. 
um, you need to account for storage space, you need to account for uh, detecting the problems yourself, which is often a big part of the battle. Uh, and if you do all the other uh, develop, the other deployment uh, use cases, um, you have to write analysis and run them on the target, and then you're slowing down the target. So it's all things that you have to manage that can be a bit complicated. So the, the big feedback that we got over the last few years is it would be nice to use the same filtering uh, facilities that LTTNG has uh, to control the tracing. So basically something that uh, would allow you to um, listen for a very rare event, and when it occurs, that's indicative of a problem, and you start tracing uh, to the ring buffers, and you capture for uh, information for a certain number of time, or a certain amount of time. Uh, or you can just perform some other uh, custom actions. And uh, a fair number of users have devised ways to do that where they would re-implement basically the filtering of LTTNG and put that aside with the instrumentation. And when they detected some uh, condition, they would use the LTTNG control API to take a snapshot or start tracing or or whatnot. So it was uh, with different levels of maturity, but it's something that people were uh, doing. So we uh, started to work on triggers. And triggers aren't really a new concept in LTTNG at this point. Uh, the first release with triggers was 2.10, uh, released in 2017. And what you have to know is that a trigger is just a way to associate a condition with an action. Uh, initially, the scope of this feature was very small. The goal was just to um, do traffic shaping on trace data. So basically, uh, you would see, okay, my buffers are getting fuller than, uh, or more quickly than I can consume them, so I have too much stuff enabled. So you start to disable less uh, important event rooms, and when the situation dies down a bit, you can re-enable them selectively, and that would be automated by a mon monitoring application. So this is what uh, this enabled. Um, so it was a, we, we already had uh, what is in the 2.13 uh, release in mind when we did that, but it was like a very good, uh, a good way to get, uh, to do the groundwork of that feature and get it out there and in production. Uh, so in uh, 2.11, we introduced new conditions, again, to satisfy a very concrete use case. Basically, we introduced uh, trace rotations at that point, and people wanted to schedule rotations every couple of megabytes, every couple of uh, seconds. And then they would want to know, okay, that trace archive is ready on that server or in this folder, and I want to perform an analysis or archive that or what, I, what have you, or do, uh, uh, yeah, do live analysis, or simply uh, keep uh, five of the rotations uh, on the system and discard the other ones. So uh, in 2.13, excuse me, um, this is where the, the trigger feature got where we wanted it to be. We added the event rule matches condition. Uh, so now triggers can fire when an event rule matches an event, much like uh, what you can do with ring buffer tracing. Uh, you have all the same, uh, the same filtering cap uh, capabilities. Uh, we also had customers that wanted to uh, basically uh, uh, start, stop, rotate, record a snapshot, or be notified when an event occurred, but some other wanted to know, okay, this event occurred, but I want to get the payload in the notification. Uh, so if uh, you can imagine two uh, applications that are talking over the network that are instrumented, you get an error, you can actually get the, the peer ID involved in a transaction, and that will allow you to report to a monitoring app that, okay, this is something, this is uh, sending me uh, malformed data. I want to take a snapshot. I want to understand what's going on right now. Um, so I'm going to show you a demo. Uh, and I'm running uh, the next release, so I hope everything's going to be all right. Um, so what I want to do in that demo is, uh, uh, let's say we, have, we want to monitor for open at syscalls, and we want to take a snapshot whenever a process um, uh, is denied the open, so it gets uh, e-access. Um, I would create a session, like you could always do, uh, in snapshot mode or flight recorder mode. You can add a channel named my channel. 
hope this is big enough. I can uh, bump a bit. And I can add context that will be collected with every syscall. In this instance, just for the demo, I'm taking a proc name, so the process name. But it, you could uh, take uh, the PID, the UID, GID, the namespaces involved with that process. Uh, so let's keep things simple. Uh, and I'm enabling all syscalls to be traced to my ring buffer that is in memory. So as you see here, uh, I'm enabling all syscalls in the kernel domain, basically. So I start my tracing. Then the new stuff is that you can define a trigger. And that trigger here, I'm going to use the mouse to highlight, but it's very simple. It's, um, I can give it a name. Here it's going to be open at EXS. And then I can define a condition. So the condition is event rule matches. We are interested in kernel syscall exit events. We want to filter. We want uh, to just select the open at uh, syscall. And then I can add a filter. Uh, I'm just interested in those that return uh, minus 13. And I want to capture a part of the context that is proc name. And when that occurs, I want to notify external applications that are interested in that, and I want to uh, capture a snapshot. So we can use the LTTNG listen command to wait for that to happen. And I'm going to be naughty and try to touch uh, ETC password. OK, so I get uh, permission denied, as you would expect. And my listener application got the notification with the proc name touch. So that's already good. I can stop LTTNG listen. I can look uh, in the folder. I have a uh, snapshot that was captured. So that's just the content of the in-memory ring buffer. And I can read the, the snapshot with Babel trace. And it's a bit compact <laughs> on the screen, or dense, rather. But uh, you can see that, indeed, we had an open at syscall for ETC password. And we see that it was denied with minus 13. But we can also see the other syscalls that occurred before that and a bit uh, after. So that's it for that part of the demo. Um, capturing value was uh, really, I would say, the most challenging part of that feature. Um, in terms of uh, implementation, we already had the, the filtering uh, virtual machine uh, in place for both the user space and kernel space tracers. Um, and that's because the event filtering uh, basically compiles down to a custom bytecode. Um, and this bytecode, or this program rather, is linked against the uh, trace point fields when it is enabled. So that only occurs once. Uh, you see it as this trace point is now on. Uh, at runtime, it's just populating the interpreter stack uh, running the bytecode, which is typically going to be a handful of instructions. And then the result of that program is either we accept or reject the event. Um, and thankfully, the VM already had to deal with uh, dynamic typing because we support variants. Um, so when uh, you can see here, when I define an event rule, I'm not implying a type. So here I'm filtering for foo being larger than 42. Uh, but we know nothing yet about foo because we, we can match multiple events. We can match event A where it seems to be an integer or event B where it seems to be a float. Okay. Uh, so that means that when we actually attach, we can resolve that and specialize the bytecode and, and be clever about that. But there are situations where we can't do that, like uh, when you use variants or when you use application contexts, which are also uh, uh, of dynamic types. So what we do is we define a new type of program by code type capture. Um, it basically only changes the return value of the program to be the location of a payload. And what we do with that payload is uh, we format it as a message back uh, message after doing the, uh, the appropriate uh, um, permission checks uh, if it's uh, for the kernel tracer to get from user and all that. Um, and that, in turn, is sent to the session daemon. And then it's uh, basically a pub-sub system where you can have a number of listeners for that trigger. Uh, we get the notification, and we dispatch it down to the various listeners. 
Um, the way the messages are sent varies between the kernel space and the user space tracer. It's just an implementation de detail, but in terms of performance, it has a, a pretty big impact. For the kernel tracer at the instrumentation site, we're basically just writing to a ring buffer. But then uh, we signal to the uh, session daemon that there's something to consume right away, rather than batching them together. Uh, so we're more optimizing for latency than throughput. Um, but at the instrumentation site, it's not so heavy. At the instrumentation site of the user space tracer, it's a non-blocking write to a pipe. So it's actually a syscall. So uh, you can imagine that this is not a replacement for ring buffer tracing. I would not suggest that you just enable tri uh, add triggers and uh, wait for events to come in through the notification system. Um, the use cases that we have uh, really, right now, people are, are being so aggressive with the filtering that they get an event every few minutes. So really, throughput is not a problem. I would expect that we're going to get uh, uh, use cases where people want more throughput, uh, and then we have a lot, of, uh, a, lot of, a lot of gains on the table. Aggregation map, uh, it's a uh, upcoming feature for 2.14, which we hope to release by the end of the year. Um, it basically addresses the other limitations of ring buffer tracing. The main one is memory overhead, both in terms of bandwidth, but also uh, space. Um, you know, tracing is cheap to a ring buffer, but it's not free, and there are situations where you just can't afford, even if it's 150 nanoseconds per event, uh, it's gonna be too much. And there are architectures out there uh, where, um, the tracing is not as efficient. Uh, for instance, on ARM64 up to recently, um, getting the CPU required a full system call. Uh, so a full system call on the, uh, the, on the fast path was killing our performance. But with RSEC and the GLBC 2.35, uh, that amounts basically to a read. So that got faster. Uh, but uh, still, there are uh, architectures out there where it's not gonna be the case. Uh, so there are costs in terms of, uh, of runtime, but there's also uh, other effects that are not desirable. Um, uh, if you're tracing to disk, the IO is gonna show up, it's gonna be a problem very rapidly, and same thing for a network. So there are certainly trade-offs to explore, and aggregation is one of those trade-offs. Um, when, uh, when you trace, uh, and really you record, I should say, uh, you are interested in the precise order of events. You want to know the payload. You want to know on which CPU it occurred. Uh, you want to know the, the order and the uh, timing respective to maybe other machines, other applications, and stuff like that. Um, maybe you don't need all of that precision, or maybe you can uh, do away with it. Uh, for aggregation, we're basically counting event rule matches. And... Um, Basically, we want to reuse our own um, eventual filtering to do the uh, aggregation. Um, you can, of course, do something very coarse like counting all syscalls, but that's probably not very going to be very useful. But you can count, like in this instance, the KMM freeze, uh, the entries into receive message, and you could filter again on the payloads. Uh, you could. Uh, count open syscalls by uh, UID 100 and so on and so forth. Um, so uh, we also had people that were, un, let's say, unknowingly doing aggregation uh, or that could have done what they do with uh, aggregation, where basically they were capturing long traces, but at the end of the day, they're just counting events. They want to know how many times did I get this event during uh, a run on the CI, what is the frequency of uh, those errors over time? And so basically, uh, you're better off doing the, uh, the aggregation in place. So we have uh, aggregation maps, which are basically per CPU arrays of counters. Uh, they allow you to use named keys to address the various um, uh, slots in the, in the, the array. They're, they have a configurable width, 32 or 64, so that's a trade-off you can explore. Uh, 3264 32, bits, and they have a configurable size uh, to bound the size of the map 
which is just going to be a number of counters. You can track overflows. Um, and this is not, I want to be transparent, this is not a new concept. It's something that existed in the kernel in the form of uh, the uh, BPF map type per CPU array. And it's very useful there. Uh, but we wanted to make that available to user space applications and keep that cheap. Um, from a, a usability standpoint, it's integrated in LTTNG the same way that the ring buffers are. So uh, if you remember my previous example, I had uh, a uh, ring buffer that I added to a session. Now I'm just adding a map. It's basically the same concept. Um, and then you can add the trigger. Uh, you specify, again, a condition, an action, increment value, and you target a specific key. So in this case, I would want to count all of the new connections uh, done by the debouché um, user. As expected, it's a lot faster than tracing to a ring buffer because obviously you're not saving the uh, payload of events. Uh, we were happy to see that for those benchmarks, which are on GitHub, if you're interested in the, all the details of the runs, uh, tracing to a ring buffer in user space goes down from 160 nanoseconds down to 43, so over three times faster. So that's, that's a, an order of magnitude that makes tracing possible uh, where it was not for some of our customers. And in terms of performance uh, for the, the, the kernel version of those uh, data structures, it's basically the same order of magnitude, as you can see. Uh, it's a bit faster than uh, the eBPF um, equivalent. And that's not surprising. There's just less going on on the fast path for that. So uh, we were happy to see that we're in the, uh, the, the, the right ballpark. Um, so, uh, yeah, just to give you an idea. So, really, it's not just a bit faster. It's a lot faster, even though we're talking about uh, nanoseconds. So, another demo of that feature. Uh, I can make some space. So, again, I'm creating a session, just a regular normal session. I'm adding a map as you said in the previous example, and I start tracing. Then I can do whatever I want. If I add the new event rules from that point on that target that map, we're going to get counts of events. So things like counting all syscalls on my machine right now would be as simple as, oh, maybe the colors are not so great for uh, this projector, but uh, basically you are defining a condition, event rule matches, and we match every event that is of type uh, kernel syscall entry. And the action is going to be increment value. And we target one key, which is going to be system call. And then I can watch my map. And you see that we have roughly uh, 10,000 syscalls per second accumulating there on an idle machine, which was surprising to me. But <laughs> we can also count uh, errors. Uh, of the syscall. So I'm interested in all errors, so I'm interested in all the syscall exit events that return uh, less than zero. And then I get, uh, I get a, again, uh, another key with a static name, syscall error count. I'm going to clear the contents of the map, so we start again from zero and see both rules together. And I can watch the map. And you see here that roughly 10%, 7%, 8% of the syscalls on my machine return an error. OK, fair enough. Now I can also uh, do pattern matching, where I will add another trigger that matches um, all the syscall exits of the message uh, uh, family of syscalls, so receive message, or send message. Um, and for each of those, I'm going to create a new key using their event name. So every syscall is going to get its own error count uh, with this rule. And none of the, uh, there's no hashing that takes place on the, the fast path. Like that allocation of the key is done one time by the session daemon at the actual trace point site. It's just an offset into the map. So it's very cheap to do, even though you have all that flexibility. I'm again clearing and then you can see uh, all of the values of the maps on my system. 
And you can see that most of the errors in that family of syscalls come from receive message. Well, all of the errors. <laughs> So that's it for that demo. The other one I have is uh, histograms. Uh, we don't support histograms natively yet. That's something we want to do. But you can uh, define the bins of your histogram uh, using uh, the filter mechanism. So it's going to be a bit less efficient than it could be, but still not quite that bad. Uh, you had a map, you start your session, and then my script creates yeah, basically a trigger per uh, bucket of the histogram with the various ranges that you see here. And then I can look at the map. That's not ideal because I'm sorting the buckets uh, lexicographically. I hope it's the right term in English. Um, but uh, we can do something nicer and send it over a WebSocket to a chart.js. Um, plot and basically you can see it live. So that's the kind of things that we want to build easily. Uh, you can consume those values using the um, LTTNG control API and we hope to provide uh, Python bindings for that uh, in the near future. So uh, for the future, because I'm short on time, uh, <laughs> uh, we want to get this released in that, uh, well, with those features for the moment, but we're looking at native uh, histogram support. That's really the big uh, thing that's missing right now. We want to allow decrementing the values, but we also want to let users use the, uh, the payload of the events to affect the uh, counters. So if you can do that, you can uh, track the memory that you're using and things like that. It, it opens up a lot of uh, new ideas. Uh, we also want to make the size of the event, if it had been recorded to a ring buffer, available. So that would allow you to do dry runs before you enable tracing to ring buffers. So you would know, okay, those ring buffer, those, those uh, event rules, they would consume two megabytes per second of bandwidth. And before you enable tracing, you would know about it. So especially for production use cases, that's uh, very uh, useful and something that people keep asking about. Uh, the other thing is we want to make LTTNG UST RSEC aware. Uh, we know that we can eliminate some uh, lock prefixed operations from the fast path, so we expect to get some very good gains, uh, although I have not obviously uh, benchmarked that yet. So yeah, that's, uh, that's all I have. Um, you can visit our website, and I've made all the benchmarks available on uh, my GitHub, uh, because I know people always have very precise questions. Uh, but I'll take your questions if you have any. All right. Well, I'll talk to you uh, after the talk. Thank you. <laughs>